Hey everybody, JJ here. Welcome back for another Saturday of Zoom Networking. Today I'm really excited. We've got two experts out of the Pace Morby Education Program, uh, Creative Finance with Pace Morby. It is probably the probably it is the premier education platform in the country today. Um, Pace Morby Creative Finance. You can look it up on YouTube. There's also a Facebook page. But the two gentlemen today are out of Pace's program, uh, Richard Knowles and Mitch Roy. These guys run the Sub2 um, SoCal networking group for Southern California. Knowledgeable. These guys are experts, business people, entrepreneurs, uh, just fantastic guys and a wealth of knowledge. Rich, Mitch, how are you guys doing today? We are doing phenomenal, JJ. Cool. Richard, brother, um, my Southern California, Glendale, California partner in crime Looking forward to us getting together soon. So, guys, um, tell us just a little bit, for those that don't know about Sub2, give us a very brief rundown about Sub2 and creative finance. And I guess that ties into your topic today. But give us a little bit of an intro for those that aren't familiar with Pace and maybe creative finance. So, uh, Sub2 is actually an amazing community. Uh, you know, Mitch and I have been in that community for almost two years now when it first started. And we actually became one of the co-leaders of Southern California. And uh, we've just been helping every student that comes in in the community. And uh, Pace Morby is a great mentor and he provides so much value. It's so much that it's like drinking water out of 500, right? So, um, you know, we're able to kind of, you know, uh, help him by, you know, helping students in Southern California, you know? So it's a great community. Uh, I strongly recommend it. It's amazing. Perfect. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to get into it. So if you want, we can start. Cool. Guys, uh Take it away. Well, first of all, JJ, uh, both Richard and I want to thank you very, very much for this opportunity to talk to you and your audience about a very exciting topic, creative finance. And we're grateful for this opportunity. And we also appreciate all that you do for our community. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. As Richard said, and, and welcome, everybody. We're looking forward to talking with you today. Uh, by way of introduction, both Richard and I are students of Pace Morby's Sub2 Mentorship. We're also the co-leaders of the SoCal so, uh, Sub2 Accountability Group. We've got an exciting agenda for you today. What we're gonna talk about, we're gonna give you an overview of some of the creative finance tools and strategies that we're using to do deals all over the country. And we're gonna share a couple of the deals we've recently closed using these tools. Before I get started, there is another partner of ours, a guy named Gabe Loriano. I wanna give a shout out to him. Uh, these deals would not be here if it was not from him. So Gabe, brother, thank you very much. What we're gonna to cover today is Richard and I are gonna give you a little brief intro of who we are and how we got here. We're going to talk about what is creative finance. And then we're gonna go over some of the common creative finance strategies that we're using. We're gonna do some case studies and then we're gonna do the breakout rooms followed by some Q and A. So that being said, let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, prior to real estate, I was a management consultant, which means most Monday mornings, I put on a blue pinstripe suit, got on an airplane and flew around the country to meet with corporate executives and there to restructure their companies. Back then I was working probably about 80 hours a week. And after flying about a million miles and being platinum on every single airline, I knew it was time for a change. And that's when I learned about real estate investing. I started real estate back in 2004 and I got involved through buying and selling notes, basically brokering mortgages, selling actual mortgages. And from there, I transitioned into doing fix and flips, single and multifamily development, ground up construction, and buy and hold cash flows. I loved it, and, and I, I totally love it, but I knew back then that I was limited in terms of what I could do and how much I could do. But I, at the time, I didn't know what I didn't know. Fast forward to the spring of 2020, almost two years ago, which is when I joined Pace's newly created mentorship. And for me, it was like going from a one dimensional world to a multiverse with options and opportunities that I could have never imagined. And not only did I learn and still continue to learn new things every single day about creative finance, I also learned all the required activities to make it happen. Things like lead generation, seller negotiations, closing techniques, underwriting deals, systems and disposition strategies, none of which I, I knew before. I, I did it the traditional way. 
I'd call a realtor, they'd send me a deal, I'd go to a bank, I'd get a loan, I'd call the realtor, I'd sell the property, and I was limited. So like Richard said, uh, the content and the, and the material, and a lot of it is bonus material that Pace provides, is like drinking from a fire hose. But more importantly, his support and his mentorship is nothing short of amazing. And you can tell this is not my first rodeo. I will credit all of what I've learned about creative finance and investing in general to Pace. So Pace, thank you, brother. Richard, can you share a little bit about your background and how you got here? Hi, uh, thank you, Mitch. Um, yes, yeah, so a little bit about me. So um, I am actually a software engineer. I graduated from Rutgers University in New Jersey with a master's degree in computer engineering. Uh, so my parents, you know, they're Jamaican parents, so they are pretty strict and, you know, they wanted me to go up the corporate ladder, uh, you know, go to school, you know, get your grades, all that kind of stuff, right? So um, I studied computer engineering and kind of, you know, followed what my parents have told me to do. And uh, really quickly, I um, just want to sh share a little story about Rutgers, um, because this is a networking uh, Zoom, and it's really important that uh, we you know, kind of uh, make sure that we always network with others. And I'll explain why. Um, at Rutgers, uh, you know, I applied for, the, for grad school and, um, you know, I actually did not get in. My application was rejected. So um, out of nowhere, somebody called me. Um, she happens to be a dean of Rutgers University um, because I had a summer internship with her previously. And she randomly called me and she asked me, how am I doing? I said, I'm doing pretty good, but, um, you know, I applied to Rutgers, but unfortunately I did not get in. So um, she's like, what, really? I'm surprised, you know, I have good grades, all that kind of stuff, right? It's a pretty competitive school. It's hard to, you know, get in and stuff like that. So uh, she made a quick phone call because she did dean at the school. And the next day uh, my application became accepted. So um, I was immediately accepted just by one phone call, right? So um, but that's not all. So. She followed up with me and said, you know, how you how you kind of pay for school? So I, I, I kind of take out loans, all that kind of stuff, right? And uh, she said, uh, you know, how about you apply for this fellowship program, uh, which is EAA, which is uh, shown on my, in the picture. Uh, and I said, sure, let me look at it. So I looked at it and uh, the application was due like the next day. Uh, I did like a 10 page essay, get my references ready, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, no way, it's impossible, physically impossible to do this, right? Um, so uh, literally like, uh, I think the next day or so, um, she gave me a call back and uh, I guess she called the fellowship program and um, I was already accepted into that fellowship program where um, I would go to school for free. Um, and I didn't, I still had to do my application, but I was already accepted before I even started my application, right? So she has done so much for me, just that one person, just by one phone call, a couple of phone calls, right? So your network is extremely important. So I thank you, JJ, for, um, you know, doing these Zooms and networking events because it's really important. You never know who in your network can help you. So always talk to people. Brent Daniels says TTP, always talk to people. You never know what somebody in your network can do for you, whether it's in life or real estate or your career, you never know. So that's a quick story, sorry to digress a little bit. Um, so moving on, uh, so I've been a former engineer at uh, Priceline.com, ESPN, Disney, and Nike. So I started doing computer engineering first out of college and grad school uh, for these companies. And uh, currently, I am a software engineer at Twitter today. So I just joined in May of last year. So uh, you're probably saying, oh, this guy's an engineer. What about real estate? So um, in 2018, um, I came across a video of Max Maxwell. Uh, some of you may know who he is, uh, a wholesaling video and a, vi a video about um, passive income. Uh, it randomly came up on my YouTube and um, I watched it and uh, my mindset has shifted. Um, you know, me as an engineer, you know, my parents taught me to go up the corporate ladder. Um, I wasn't really taught about passive income and things like that. And, uh, you know, that one video watching Max Maxwell had changed my life. Uh, you know, I'm working night and day in engineering. I'm doing freelancing projects, uh, all that kind of stuff. I'm busting my ASS, you know, I'm trying not to curse on here, uh, you know, every day, you know. So um, when I saw that video, uh, my mind started shifted, you know. So I started uh, side hustling, I guess you would say, in real estate in 2018. Um, and I began by learning uh, how to fix and flip by doing private lending. So rather than 
taking, I'm a very conservative risk taker. So I don't like taking a uh, big risk, right? Uh, you no, know, let's say high risk, high rewards. I'd rather do low risk, low rewards. Uh, that's just the way I am. I'm very conservative. Um, so I decided to just do some private lending and uh, kind of partner with the Bitcoin flipper and learn how they do the flips and stuff like that. And come to find out that I didn't really like it. Um, you know, uh, you chill on the wall, you never know what's going to happen. You know, there's leaks, uh, you know, electrical issues, all that kind of stuff. So I found out that was not for me, but private, private lending was totally fine. Um, that was good. And then I did some Airbnb through timeshare arbitrage. Uh, some of you may or may not know what that is, but it's very similar to rental arbitrage where you're um, basically renting an apartment or a house and you're putting on Airbnb, right? So I did something similar uh, called uh, timeshare arbitrage where instead of rentals, it's timeshares. And I learned that by partnering with uh, somebody who's already doing this. Um, I was researching on Airbnb and I found some super hosts and I asked them, you know, hey, how are you doing this? You know, um, can I partner with you? Can I help you? And um, so we actually partnered up and um, I was helping over the system and stuff like that. So uh, my way of learning and getting experience was by partnering with other people who are already experienced at the things that I want to learn, right? So again, networking, always talking to people. You never know uh, who you might partner with and what they can do for you, uh, help you achieve your goals, right? And uh, the third bullet, uh, I'm joining two mentorships, uh, one in 2019 and 2020. So I joined Multifamily Monopoly in summer 2019 uh, with Alvin Hope Johnson. Uh, it was a great, great uh, mentorship program. Uh, he's still my mentor today. Um, I can call him anytime. Uh, so I gained some knowledge on Multifamily. And of course, uh, Sub2 in spring 2020 with Pace Moby. Uh, again, great community, uh, great mentor. Uh, best place to be on earth. You know, I have a Sub2 shirt uh, representing Sub2 right now. Um, amazing community. I wouldn't have met Mitch if it wasn't for Sub2. So uh, lastly, um, throughout my, I guess, three to four years, I gained experience in wholesaling, creative financing, multifamily, and Airbnb. So that's about me. Uh, so uh, how did Mitch and I meet? So um, as you mentioned, we've both been in Sub2 uh, since 2020. And uh, we were the co-leaders. We are still the co-leaders of Southern California for Sub2. Uh, so we've been on Zooms. We've been on phone calls, uh, you know, kind of coordinating and helping Sub2 students, helping the community. Um, but we never actually met in person until January 2021, when I actually had a, a seller appointment in San Diego. It was a, a multi-million dollar property. Um, it was like a six-figure um, assignment fee type deal. And I really wanted this to go very well. So I said, hey, Mitch, why don't you come join me on the seller appointment? And uh, we got to the appointment and uh, Mitch completely took over. Um, he had a great romance with the seller. You know, I'm sitting there like, you know, uh, you guys know I'm here, right? Like, I didn't have to do anything. I was just hands off. You know, like Mitch was closing the deal right there. You know, um, yeah, he's a great report builder. Like his report building is just amazing, you know, and um, that's not one of my best uh, strengths, you know, so... Um, seeing that, you know, uh, we kind of recognize, you know, our strengths and weaknesses, right? So I'm very good at tech, you know, it's part of my career, it's part of uh, technology, what I do on an everyday basis, on a daily basis. And uh, Mitch felt like, you know, he wasn't that strong in, uh, in technology, um, but he's a great coder and great report builder. I'm not really that good on the phone. So uh, we decided, okay, uh, my strength is your weakness. His weakness is my strength. Okay, so let's partner up, let's squat up. So that's exactly how we uh, came together. Uh, so uh, that's how we met. So um, now I'll turn it back over to Mitch to talk about uh, creative financing. I gotta say, Richard, you're very humble. You're, you're scary smart when it comes to systems and integration and computers. And I want people to know that. He does stuff that I don't even understand. That's how good he is. But thank you, that, that was a good uh, introduction. So let me ask you everybody, what is creative finance? And I'm gonna ask the question of who here has ever lost a deal to someone else who has a higher offer? Or how about a seller that wants more than you'll pay and won't drop their price? Or maybe you didn't have the cash or the bank loan to do the deal. We've all been there. So enter creative finance. And the way I see creative finance, it's a set of tools and strategies and techniques that allow us to get ownership of properties without using bank loans and with little to none of our own cash. And as you might imagine, this provides a formidable edge 
over your competition. It also helps us close more deals and solve more seller problems than traditional financing can do. And the best part, you're using little to none of your own money. That's the beautiful part. So let's talk about creative finance and let's break it down and talk about lead generation and really what is this business about? And I think Zig Ziglar says it best, you're out of business if you don't have a prospect. Well, for creative finance and really any type of real estate, we we need to understand first and foremost, the lifeblood of this business starts with lead generation, which in, in our world means a steady supply of motivated sellers that have real estate related problems they can't sell. Okay, great. What happens when you get a lead? What do you do next? We get on the phone, we speak with them directly. And, and this is a really, really important part of our business, something we like to distinguish ourselves because we have a mindset shift from, I would say, the traditional real estate model. So when we talk to sellers, and I'll speak for myself for certain, when I talk to sellers, I don't see myself so much as a real estate investor, so much as a problem solver and a go-giver that happens to be working in the real estate space. So what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that when we talk to sellers, we actively listen to what they're saying. And sometimes they're going to come up, come right out and say, hey, I'm in foreclosure. And other times they will dance around it because they're just not comfortable sharing that information with a complete stranger. But we already know that going in and we gently let them know we know without making an issue of it or making them feel bad, just the opposite. We want them to feel comfortable and feel trust with us. So our primary objective then when talking to sellers is to understand and solve their problem. We train our entire team this way. And you know what? Occasionally, that means we're not going to be the right solution for any number of reasons. And in those cases, we will always offer the seller a number of other options and solutions that are better suited to what they want to achieve. So continuing that, What is our process when we talk to sellers? We have an engagement process. When we talk to sellers, we approach every seller in the same seller-focused consultative process. The first order of business, and Richard said this earlier, is to build rapport, build trust, and build credibility. Without that, it's gonna be a tough call. So build rapport, build trust, and build credibility. Once we've done that successfully, and and this is usually in a phone call, pretty quick phone call, We then start to collect the underlying facts about the seller's situation and the seller's property, literally everything we can about the property. And we want to understand what's going on with that seller. We're seeking to understand their problem and confirm their pain and their motivation. And by doing this, this approach allows us to understand and solve their problem. And This is why we love creative finance. It's the perfect vehicle to do this because it provides us with so many tools to solve their problems. So we're going to talk about creative finance. And I I think it's important to note, and we're going to do a high level summary. There's a lot uh, here and it might be like drinking from a fire hose. But one point to take away is there's no one size fits all solution. Every seller situation is different and requires a customized solution unique to their needs. And that's the beauty of creative finance. Each of the tools that we're going to show you today uh, can be customized to meet the seller's needs. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to show you some, but not all of the more common creative finance strategies that we are using in our business every day. We're going to talk about subject to deals. We're going to talk about seller finance deals. We're going to talk about hybrid deals. We're going to talk about cash out refi and sub two deals, one of my favorites. And we're going to talk about novations and wraps. And then we're going to get into some case studies. Let's get right into it. Subject two. Subject two is when we buy a property subject to the existing financing. What that means is the existing loans stays in place under the borrower's name. We take ownership of the property. The deed transfers to us and we own the property. And then we make monthly payments Uh, on that mortgage and all the other expenses, the PITI, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, all the utilities. And then in turn, we profit on the spread between the PITI, our expenses, and what we can either rent it for or Airbnb it for or resell it on a wrap. That's our income. That's how we make the spread. Let me do a simple example. Let's say we buy a property subject to for $100,000. 
And let's say this property has a mortgage of 95,000 at a four and a half percent interest rate. And for argument's sake, let's say the PITI is $1,200 a month. That's what we're responsible for. We would then rent this property in a very simple example for let's say $1,700, netting us $500 a month cash flow. That's very simple how subject to works. When do we use this and why? It is a great strategy when a seller wants a higher price than we're willing to pay with cash, or the property has very little equity for them to sell it on the MLS. And, and Richard touched on this earlier that you know, we do wholesaling. We typically will start with a cash offer. And depending on what part of the country you are in, those cash offers can be anywhere from 55 to 85% of ARV. A lot of sellers will not sell their property for that number. This is where we can use a subject to type deal and get them close to 90, 95, 100% of their ask price or the ARV and put together a win-win deal that works for everyone. So the bottom line, subject to, allows us to pay a higher price when required so long that the property cash flows. And the key point to remember on subject to, we're not buying for appreciation. So that's, I'm okay paying close to market value today. I know in 10, 15 years, the property will appreciate, but we're buying for long-term cash flow. And when we structure these deals, we seek to put little to no money down. So the property literally finances itself and pays down the mortgage all while we're cash flowing. And the best part is, typically we've invested very little to none of our own money. Okay, let's move over to seller financing. Seller financing is when a property typically has no mortgage or liens, generally free and clear. The seller is essentially becoming the bank. We're upgrading them from an owner to a lender by extending us credit to buy their property without all the traditional hoops and hurdles and costs we would face in getting a bank loan. So let's say we bought a property for, pick a number, $100,000 on seller financing with the following terms, $5,000 down payment, 0% interest and a 15 year term. We would then calculate the monthly PI, principal and interest payments, and we would create a mortgage in favor of the seller that incorporates these terms. Now, note, I said 0% interest. A lot of times we'll do a deal with 0% interest, but sometimes we do pay interest on their money. And when we do, we typically roll that amount into the purchase price, thereby keeping our cash flow high. Ask me more about that in the breakout rooms or doing the Q&A, and we'll talk more about that. So then pretty simply, each month we pay the seller and we make our profit, just like we do in a sub two deal. We're, instead of the, the bank, we're dealing with the seller and we might rent the property out and make the spread on the numbers, the PITI to the rent ratio. That's what we're doing. Pretty straightforward. The next type of deal that we uh, do is what's called a hybrid. And it's essentially a combination of a subject to and a seller finance deal. That's what it is. And this is an approach we use when we're doing a sub two, but the seller has a, a big enough piece of equity that needs to be paid out. So for example, again, let's say we're buying a property for $100,000 and we put a $5,000 down payment down, but this property, unlike the other one, has a $60,000 mortgage, leaving $40,000 of seller equity. When well, seller's gonna want their equity. Just like we do in sub two, we buy the property subject to the mortgage and we take ownership, the deed transfers to our name and the mortgage stays in the seller's name. And then just like we do in the seller finance example I just did, we now create a mortgage in favor of the seller. In this case, 35,000, why 35 and not 40? because their equity was 40 and I gave them a $5,000 down payment. So I bought down their equity by $5,000. I then create a mortgage in their favor for $35,000. Might be 0% interest, might be whatever, 2% interest. We figure out the P&I on it and we add it to our monthly expense. So then each month we make a payment to the seller's lender and we make one to the seller for that amount. And then again, we profit off the spread between what we can rent it for less our PITI and other expenses. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, the next deal we do, and I, I'd say this is probably one of my favorites, one of my most exciting, this is called a cash out refi and sub two. This is a really, really smart deal. And actually it, it blew my mind when I first learned about it and, and it still does today. I, I love, and I love telling sellers about this deal because you can see the light bulb 
go off in their head as they see how powerful this is. We use this strategy when the seller wants a really, really big cash down payment, 20, 30, 40, 50% of the ARV, usually in its amount that we're not going to pay cash and, and would probably kill the deal. Here's how it works. If the seller has pretty reasonable credit and the property has some equity, we have the seller do a cash out refi. They get a new loan, typical conventional 30 year fixed rate, three and a half percent loan, which would pay off any old loans and cashes them out with a good chunk of their equity, which comes back to them in the form of cash. So what happens? This provides them with the large cash down payment they were asking for. Now, the most amazing part of this and the, and the, and the part that people have trouble wrapping their head around, guess how much taxes they're gonna pay on that cash? Exactly, they pay zero tax on that because it's a loan. And because it's a loan, it's not considered taxable income. So they get a check that's now not considered income. Great. Once we do that, we then take over that new loan subject to, just like we've done as we described earlier, and we've created a win-win solution. The seller gets their high price, they get a big cash down payment, and we get a cash flowing property with a brand new mortgage, and we use very little or none of our own money. And again, it's the property that's financing this, not us. That's the beauty of it. Okay, let's talk about novation agreements. Now we're gonna get into something completely different. Novation agreements are a great strategy to use when doing a fix and flip project. Essentially, in a very simple manner, it's a partnership between us, the investor buyer and the seller. And typically the way these work is, the seller generally will bring the property and keeps ownership ownership of it and keeps paying all the bills, the PITI, the utilities. And I say generally because the buyer can also agree to pay these costs and sell to the seller. Our part, what we bring to the table, we do all the reno. Then we sell the property and share the profit with the seller. Now, what's great about this approach is it saves us the cost of having to purchase the house. It eats up a lot of uh, bank money, uh, points, fees, closing costs, interest, all of that. And after we do the renovation, we sell it and we share the profit. And usually there's usually three major ways that it's done. Guaranteed minimum profit for the seller, guaranteed minimum profit for the investor, or a fixed percentage split after the costs have all been paid for. And it's all negotiable. Again, this is a creative way to get us into a deal at a lower cost and without having to buy the property or mu use much of our own funds. The last one uh, we're going to talk about here is what's called a wrap. This is this is we're getting into some you know college level stuff here. This is a great way, and I look at this like this: it's a great way to take a typical sub two deal and ramp up the cash flow and the profit beyond what we would typically get from a rental or an Airbnb type deal. Here's how we do it: we buy a property subject to seller finance or even a hybrid, just like I described earlier. Then instead of renting the property and cash flowing it, we instead find a buyer who can easily afford the purchase price, the monthly payment, and the down payment that we create, but has a credit score that might not qualify them to obtain a conventional bank loan at a favorable rate. In a sense, then, we become their seller finance lender. So let's, let's do a simple little example. Let's say we buy a property sub two. We're buying it from the seller for $100,000. We put 5% down. And for example, let's say this mortgage they have has a PITI of $1,200 a month. The underlying loan we take over, in our example, let's say it's 3.5% fixed rate and there's 15 years remaining. We're going to take that property and we're going to sell it. We're going to sell it for $125,000, 25 more than we bought it, 10% down, double the down payment on a 15-year loan at an interest rate of 5% point and a half higher than we're getting it for. We just made an additional 25 off the purchase price, plus immediate cash in our pocket at close of escrow from the buyers down, plus the monthly spread on the higher mortgage payments each month. Now, what we do is we create a mortgage in our favor with the terms we just discussed that in turn wraps around the existing seller mortgage, hence the term wrap. We're wrapping a mortgage around a mortgage. Now, since we're selling the property, we're no longer the buyer, I mean, the owner, excuse me. We're actually becoming the lender to this buyer while still being the borrower to the seller we bought the property from, if that makes sense. So each month, the buyer and new owner makes their payments to us. 
And out of that, we pay the underlying loan and we make the spread on the payments. Very simple. So we get cash down payment at close, a higher sales price, and the buyer gets to buy the property and live in it. Beautiful. Those are the key things we're doing these days. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit more, but at this point, I want to turn it back over to Richard, and he's going to talk about some of the deals we've done using these exact strategies. Richard, you want to take it over, my friend? Hey, thank you, Mitch, for uh, digging into the different ways to do creative financing, uh, so many different ways, um, and that's just a select few, uh, the most common ones that we do. There are many more. Uh, when you have problems, uh, there is no problem that's i mean every problem is unique right so you can't always apply the same solution to every single problem right so um so we can use these concepts to, to kind of uh, figure out what's the best solution for each one right so uh, i'm going to dig in into one of the deals that we've done um actually in escrow right now actually so i'm pretty excited about this one uh so i'm very excited to share with you guys how we got this deal and uh i'll walk you through how we got this lead, um, what form of lead generation we did, what was the seller's problem that we were trying to solve, and lastly, how did we solve that problem? So I'll walk you through step-by-step step from A to Z, um, how we got this lead, and how we were able to get an escort with this lead. So uh, this is a lead generation timeline. So um, this is exactly how we started. So we pulled a uh, pre foreclosure list from PropStream, right, in all of our markets. So currently in Southern California, Atlanta, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Orlando. So those are primary markets right now. So I pulled a pre foreclosure list for the team, and uh, we had our VAs cold call that list, and using Zen call, and um, our VA, Kerry, using Calendly set an appointment for our acquisitions, acquisitions team. Um, so you kind of need to kind of uh, set appointments uh, for the seller and acquisitions. So at least they know when we're going to call if you're not able to do a live transfer, right? So they know they get a text, you know, 10 minutes before that they're going to get a, a call from us, right? So it kind of sets that expectation. Setting expectations is really important when talking to sellers. They want to know what's the next step, what's going to happen next, you know? So uh, they have thousands of people calling them. If you're a pre closure, there was hundreds of investors calling them, right? So if they know to expect your call, uh, they're going to be there at that time, right? Uh, so the next step is uh, acquisitions. So uh, our teammate, Gabe, who's a great closer on our team, uh, he spoke with the seller to collect information and find the pain points, right? So he had a conversation over the phone, uh, all virtual, right? All virtual. This property is in Orlando, and we are based in California. So this is all virtual over the phone. And fourth step is to start underwriting. So Gabe collected information from the seller and uh, collected what the problem is, what is the seller trying to solve, uh, what is her issue, and how can we, uh, you know, come and help her, you know. So uh, we as a team, Mitch, Gabe, and I, we came together, analyzed the deal, analyzed the problem, and uh, we crunched some numbers and thought about different exit strategies to uh, kind of, you know, acquire this deal and dispo this deal. Dispo, dispo meaning, uh, you know, whether we're going to assign it to another investor or we're going to keep it or we're going to Airbnb it or we're going to do a short-term rental, long-term rental, et cetera. What is the exit strategy? So based on the exit strategy, uh, we were able to underwrite the deal and come up with a solution for the seller. So uh, we sent an offer to the seller and it, I think it was about a third, second or third call uh, with the seller and uh, she accepted the offer. And we went through uh, constant close for transaction coordination. Uh, they're a great company. I strongly recommend them for transaction coordinating. So that's kind of the timeline uh, from how we got the data to getting escrow. So that's essentially the process that we went through. And then, so what was the seller's problem? So as I mentioned, we pulled a pre foreclosure list. So the seller was in pre foreclosure, had not paid a mortgage in two years. So it's a very long time. I think it was about 811 days uh, that they haven't paid the mortgage. And secondly, she lost her job due to COVID, uh, which unfortunately um, happened. And she was able to get a new job, um, but she was able to get forbearance. So she lost her job, but she was in forbearance. So that's why she was able to not pay for so long, right? 
And then uh, thirdly, she uh, was going through divorce. So there was some issues going on with the family and things like that. So, and uh, lastly, uh, she mentioned that the house was too big um, since she's going through divorce, you know, so uh, she wants to downsize, move somewhere else where she had a smaller home. You know, it was too much to clean with a big home like that, right? So, so um, digging more into the seller's problem, so, uh, the mortgage balance for the property was 343000 roughly, with a PITI of $2,000 per month. And the arrears, meaning the back payments, how much she owed on the property, was $64,000. Uh, so that's the amount required to cure the loan, so bring the loan back current. And uh, she wanted at least two k to walk away with. So she just wanted to be done. Uh, she just wanted some cash to walk away. Uh, she doesn't care what happens. She just wanted to walk away with 2K, so have some money in the pocket, right? So 2K was her primary goal, right? So uh, now that we had a, her problem and uh, we understand, you know, what she's going through, and we obviously as investors, um, but also uh, I'm, I love helping people. That's just, you know, part of my personality. You know, I just love helping people, whether it's in real estate or, you know, my friends, my family, you know, um, I'm always, uh, people say I'm a go-giver. Just the way I was raised, you know, I just love helping people. If I have $1 in my name, I'm going to give you all of all of it. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that's just the way I am. So uh, so we took this information that we had from a seller and we thought, okay, um, how are we going to solve the problem? How can we make this a win-win situation for both of us, right? So let's take a deep dive. So uh, first off, let's talk about the property itself, right? So uh I'll back up a second. So always focus on the seller when talking to sellers, right? Don't focus too much on the property. Focus on the seller. What is the seller's problem? What is she looking for? What does she want? What is her needs, right? Focus on her. Communicate with her. Don't focus too much on the property. If you focus too much on the property, um, there's going to be barriers between you and the seller. Uh, you're going to fall out of communication. Uh, she might think you're rude. Uh, I think like that. So um, always focus on the seller. Be very friendly with them. Uh, be the consultant, be the advisor. Okay, so that's what you want to be in this business. Real estate is a relationship business. It's a people business, right? You can't get deals done without talking to people, right? You can't have a buyer for a deal without talking to people, right? So you have to talk to people. You have to build a network. You have to have good communication skills. You got to talk back and forth and uh, be personable, right? So uh, to jump into pop property information, so as I mentioned before, it's in Orlando, Florida. Uh, it was built about um, less than 10 years ago. I don't want to get the exact information right now because it's an escrow. Uh, it has five bedrooms and uh, it is about 4,000 square feet. So it's a really big house, a uh, huge house. And it's in excellent condition. So uh, a lot of pre uh, you might think that, you know, it's a preconceived notion that it might not be in good condition, but it's in excellent condition. It was. Perfect. It doesn't even need paint. Uh, maybe just vacuuming. Uh, that's it. It was that perfect, you know. So um, got some Windex. That's it. That's all I needed. Windex, you know. Uh, so uh, it was about twenty minutes away from Disney World. So uh, it's pretty close. So pretty good touristy area, and it's worth about five hundred fifty thousand in its current condition. Okay. So uh, that's a little bit about the property. So um, as far as exit strategy, so. Uh, there's many different ways that we can do this. Obviously, uh, wholesaling is uh, one of the ways. So um, if you were to go to wholesale about uh, the equity in the property is about 120,000 right off the bat. And um, I buyers like Zillow, Offerpad, Sunday, Open Door, all those uh, I buyer companies, their premium offer was around $509,000. Um, so uh, I don't know if you remember the numbers from last slide, but um, that's much higher than uh, purchase price, right? So, um, and keep in mind with the iBuyers, you have to hold the property for at least 60 days. Um, you cannot assign to iBuyers. So that is a, I guess, a roadblock that we'd have with wholesaling. So you have to actually buy the property yourself, hold it for 60 days, pay all the holding costs, all that stuff. And then you'll be able to flip it to an iBuyer. Or uh, you could do a wholesale, right? A wholesale, uh, basically, you know, you get it under contract and you list it on the market um, for, you know, retail value, which would be about 550. So um, the estimated profit 
on wholesale or hotel will be 51,000, um, you know, plus uh, more than that. After ho uh, holding costs, holding costs, depending if you wholesale it uh, to a, uh, I buy and holding it for 60 days uh, or if you put it on the market, uh, you have to pay realtor fees and all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, estimated profit is about 51,000 uh, plus 50 to 60, maybe $1,000. A long-term rental is another exit strategy. Uh, so if you want to just put a tenant in there, a long-term, a year tenant, uh, the estimated rent in the area is about 3,200 bucks a month. So these numbers come from Redfin, Zillow, um, PropStream. Also, we call property managers in the area to kind of get an estimate of what the rents might be. It's actually higher than uh, $3,200 per month. But like I said before, I'm very conservative. So I want to... Uh, have the number as low as possible. You know, risk comes to risk, you know. Um, so I don't always take the average, I always take the lower delta, you know. So um, I have the average to be around, with estimated rent to be about $3,200, right? I think the average is about $3,500, uh, I think, but uh, I think $3,200 just to be conservative, you know, because, you know, a lot of different factors, right? You have COVID, you know, things might fluctuate, uh, vacancy, all that kind of stuff. We never know. So monthly expenses would be about uh, 2,300 bucks a month. So uh, the PITI is around the principal interest taxes and sales, that's PITI. So that's our monthly expenses. And uh, it's about $2,000 a month. And another 300 for utilities, well, we'll probably get the tenant pay utilities, but uh, you know, cover for vacancy, maintenance, you know, plumbing issues, you know, uh, the garbage, uh, right tasks, uh, sewage, that kind of stuff, right? If you, if you pay that. Sometimes you can make the seller pay that, that cost, but roughly about 2,300. So that would be a monthly cash for about 900 bucks a month, right? If we did a long-term rental. All right, so next option is a short-term rental uh, through Airbnb. So what I'm showing here is a screenshot of AirDNA. So AirDNA is a software that kind of analyzes, um, you know, uh, if you market your property in Airbnb, you know, what kind of revenue you get, what your profits would be, uh, what your monthly property management costs would be, and things like that. So um, they estimate that the annual revenue for this property would be, a, be about $65,000, almost 66000 in annual revenue. And the average nightly rate for this property would be about $260 per night. And the op occupancy rate is 69%. So that's saying that 69% of the year, um, it will be occupied, right? So uh, that's kind of the rough numbers from AirDNA. So uh, to break it down even further, so um, the yearly net operating income. So after all expenses, after the property management, after the cleaning, after all that stuff, the estimated net yearly is forty five thousand per year, and the monthly that that brings it down to three thousand seven hundred per month uh, monthly net operating income. Okay. And uh, that results in about a monthly cash flow of 1,700 bucks. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, uh, we will have property management in place. We have to pay the PITI. Uh, we do have an entry fee of having to furnish the apartment. So uh, with a long-term tenant, uh, you don't have to furnish the apartment, right? You do have to maintain the property, of course. Same thing with the short-term rental as well. Uh, but you kind of, you know, it's easier to maintain it because you have um, short-term uh, tenants, I guess, coming in, or guests coming in, Airbnb guests coming in every week or every few days, right? So you can easily come in there and clean up the property, right? So uh, so you will have to pay cleaning fees, right? You have to have somebody come in and clean the property, right? So uh, the cost of running Airbnb is much higher than uh, doing a long-term rental, right? But of course, the monthly cash flow is much greater. So that's a trade-off between the short-term rental and the long-term rental, right? So uh, one, you have to main uh, spend, more time, spend more time maintaining, the other less time maintaining, right? One time, one of them is more higher entry fee, one is less entry fee, right? So Airbnb at the higher entry fee, you have to finish it, uh, property management, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, that's something to keep in mind when considering uh, when you acquire a deal, whether it be a creative deal, um, if you want to go the long-term route or short-term route. So like I said, um, you know, you want to 
kind of decide whether you want to go short term or long term. And like Billy Cox said, you can't build a long term future on short term thinking. By that I mean I don't mean specific to rentals. I mean in terms of the exit strategy. Um, so for example, the short term in this case would be wholesaling, right? I would get a quick fit, a quick profit, right? I'll be in and out. I'm done. Uh, long term would be I'm doing a uh, long term tenant. Well, I'm doing Airbnb. I'm just cash flowing every single month. And of course, sub two pace movie, he preaches long term, right? You want to have cash flow. It's all about the cash flow, right? If you want to have a good future, if you want to pass it down to your kids, you know, future generations, long term is very important. Use wholesaling short term to build capital, right? If you need capital, you can build capital. But always, so that was me. I was building capital over the past couple of years, but now I'm starting to keep my properties now for long term. Right, I have enough capital now to be able to hold properties and you know provide for my kids, you know, have them, you know, have properties, you know, when they're born or when they pass it to their kids, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So something to think about when you're um, analyzing your deals and you know trying to figure out what exit exit strategy you want to go with, you know. So what solution did we decide to go with? So we decided to uh, take over the property subject too. Uh, so we're gonna take over the uh, the payments. So we are uh, the pussy's price. So you see the screenshot of the actual contract that we have with her. So uh, we have a total pussy's price of four hundred and twelve thousand dollars, right? The earnest money deposit of two hundred fifty bucks, very small amount of money, um, and the the loan balance, the approximate uh, mortgage was three hundred forty three thousand dollars, about roughly, and the arrears was about 64,000, as I mentioned in previous slides. So uh, we're going to essentially, if we acquire this property subject to, we're responsible for the arrears. In order to get title, we have to clear the loan. We have to pay the arrears and catch up on the loan, right? So we are responsible for that $64,000 in order to acquire this property, right? And the seller actually wanted $2,000, but you know, I, I'm a nice guy, you know, I, like I said, you know, I love to give back and, um, you know, I decided I'll give you $5,000, right? I want to give you some extra money, you know? Uh, so we decided to give her $5,000 and also uh, pay for her moving costs. So we're going to pay for the moving costs. We're going to hire people to clean the property and help um, pack her things. She didn't have to lift her finger, okay? Uh, we're going to send packers there to the house uh, she can sit in a chair and watch them pack her clothes, pack her furniture, all that stuff, right? So she didn't have to lift her finger. So we're providing that service for her. It's all about uh, customer service. It's, it's a real estate business, but it's all about customer service as well. So uh, we are doing, the, we're going the extra mile for her, I would say, right? So, um, so yeah, we're going to take over subject two. The PITI is about $2,000 per month. So that'll be our monthly cost uh, and we're responsible for uh, 64,000 in a year. So essentially we will pay $64,000 to acquire the property and uh, pay the seller $5,000 to walk away, right? Um, so that's essentially our cost to acquire this property. Just 64,000 plus 5,000. So our cost is roughly around $70,000 plus the clothing costs and the, uh, the moving costs, right? So maybe about $75,000 um, so we're acquiring this property for about $7,000, a property worth $550,000 for about $70,000, right? Um, but we're actually going to go into a loan modification right now. So what that means is, um, you know, we can put the arrears back into the loan, right? So the $64,000, we can put that into the back end of the loan. Instead of us having to take our private money to for the sixty-five thousand, seventy thousand, uh, we can put those sixty-four thousand dollars back into the loan by doing a loan modification. And uh, so, what that means is basically we're going to talk to the bank and say, "Hey, you know, the seller's going through a rough time. Um, you know, she lost her job. You know, she um, is going through a divorce. You know, um, can we please, you know, come to an agreement where we can put the arrears back into the loan um, and." Uh, you know, we will continue making those payments, right? Uh, so we're going through that right now. It takes about 45 to 60 days uh, for the loan modification to go through. So uh, we're actually going through that right now. 
and uh, the loan modification can also help increase the cash flow, right? So sometimes with a loan modification, you can also increase the loan term, right? So a standard loan term is 30 years, but sometimes you can increase it to 35 years, sometimes even 40 years. That has, that's uh, pretty new because of COVID. So sometimes some loans are extended to 40 years, right? So that $2,000 uh, PITI monthly payment might be decreased by a little bit because you're extending the loan term, right? So it can go down to 1900, maybe 1800. Uh, we have to see what we can do with the, with the bank is some negotiation there, right? So, uh, so we're going we're going to increase our monthly cash flow that way, right? Uh, so that's the purpose of the loan modification to avoid having to pay the arrears. Uh, we can pay it, but we want to kind of optimize our profits, right, and decrease our entry fee, right? So that's one of the purposes of a loan modification. And uh, lastly, uh, we're scheduled to close in about 45 days, sometime in April. And uh, as far as our exit strategy, uh, we're going to put an Airbnb. Uh, so uh, we'll probably cash for about 1,700 bucks per month on this deal. Uh, if a loan modification goes through, uh, we'll be essentially, you know, zero dollars out of the pocket uh, with the private money. Um, so without the private money, probably around uh, just closing costs we pay and um, paying for moving costs and a $5,000 to the seller, right? So that'd be about $7,000, $8,000 out of our pockets without private money. So we acquire this property for $8,000 with $550,000. That's pretty amazing. Uh, to cash for about $1.7K per month. It's an amazing deal. And uh, we could not have done this without Pace Mobi and Sub2 community. Uh, it's truly amazing. So without learning, creative financing, and all those strategies, learning how to just tackle each problem in unique ways, uh, we will not be where we are now, you know, acquiring these deals. This is an amazing deal. This is amazing, right? Uh, so I strongly recommend you uh, to kind of learn creative financing. Uh, we're more than happy to JV with you. Uh, we, it, we've been sub two for almost two years now, right? So we wanted first OGs uh, in the group. So we're more than happy to walk you through anything. Uh, we can help you underwrite. We can help you uh, with the questions, things like that. So I just want to thank you for our time. So uh, we have our short links here where you can find information to reach us. You have our phone numbers on there, uh, Facebook, Instagram. You can reach out to us on there. And you'll see these three links um, about you know partnering with us. So uh, if you want to get paid for your dead leads, uh, by that I mean maybe a lead that does not work for a traditional wholesale deal. Um, it might work for a creative financing. Uh, feel free to sign up as a referral partner. And uh, we have all the information on the on the short link on the website. And you can actually see a dashboard. By the way, shout out to Ryan Williams. Um, he helped with setting this up. Uh, he has a great platform CRM where you can uh, kind of see all the leads that you've submitted and the progress of each lead. So if you have a lead that you're working on, you submit it to us, um, you will see the progress, whether it's in progress, under contract, somebody had an offer, et cetera. So you can kind of see the percentage of which ones are closing, which ones are rejected, uh, that kind of thing. So it's a great CRM, uh, which you will have access to. So again, shout out to Ryan Williams for helping out with that. Um, and also I have the meetup link as well. So uh, Mitch and I are also the, Mitch, myself, uh, Mike and Briglio and Steve Anderson, uh, we host a meetup for Southern California called Creative JV in Southern California. Uh, we try to have one every month. So uh, feel free to sign up on the meetup link there. If you'd like to meet us in person, uh, network with our community, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's pretty much everything uh, about me. Uh, Mitch, do you have anything you want to add uh, to that? I think that's it. I think we're gonna have a lot of good questions and looking forward to the breakout rooms. Thank you, great job. Wow. That was fantastic, man. I, I, I'm so glad this is recorded because we've got all that knowledge, all that information, and uh, just a, a friggin' wealth of knowledge. Again, you know, just to summarize what we talked about to begin with, you guys are out of the, are out of the creative finance group with Pace Morby. And to Pace Morby's creative finance group and sub two that people would engage in, that they could then learn how to acquire this knowledge. It's not something you're going to really get. Um, it's really kind of specialized. It's a great program. 
with a lot of training and cooperation in the community. So, um, yeah, hey, that was great, man. So uh, if you guys are watching the video right now, you're on YouTube, please like this video. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and, you know, like Richard and Mitch's video. And if you're on the call right now, hang on, because we're going to go into breakout rooms. And we're going to have the Q&A after that. Everybody else, we'll see you next week. Over and out.